And welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 183. Today we're going to be looking at the notion of artistic still life and why it's an amazing genre to be able to really practice and hone your photography skills, particularly in composition and light. Uh, we're also going to, I will also give you a rundown of the latest smug board um, leader, well, where we are in smug points with the leaderboard, um, where I'll be setting a a challenge for next week and I'll be looking at a couple of people who've sent in images for feedback. So plenty to do, plenty to see, plenty to listen to. Stick around. So yes, welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres um, here live on YouTube, unless you happen to be watching the recordings. Uh, if you are watching live, then leave me a comment. Let me know who you are, where you are, uh, what the weather's doing, any particular interesting things. And as we go, feel free to leave comments, ask questions, um, all this kind of stuff. Uh, if, you're, if you're actually watching the recorded, and big, let's face it, here on the YouTube channel, we now have 182 recorded other ones that you can be watching at least. Um, then I, think I tend to forget you can leave comments there too. So if you happen to be watching it back and there's something you want to comment on or ask about, I think generally speaking YouTube um, usually get notifications that somebody's left a comment on a on a um, on a video. So you can you know if there's something you want to kind of ask a particular question on or something, then feel free to do so. Uh, I can see we've got a few people in already. Uh, VG says, good evening, friends. From uh, A warm and cosy evening from Chennai in India. Jack says, warm and sunny in Florida. April says, greetings from a cloudy and mild Long Island, New York. Susan says, hi all from an almost sunny Kakubri in a mild 8 degrees C. Uh, Maggie says, hello from Carl Douglas, a bit dull here. Janet says, hi from Mississauga, where it is cooling down from a very warm week for February. 15 degrees C on Friday, and the previous record for this date was 10.6. Um, oh, that's, that's pretty, that's for, for the middle of Canada, that's in the middle of winter, that's pretty amazing. Uh, John says, hello all from a, a nice Columbus in Ohio. Rosie, oh, Rosemary says, good morning all from a fickle spring-like Washington state. April says, a jack, I want to be there. Oh, Robert joins us, says, howdy all from Texas. Stacy says, good morning from Hatrow, Pennsylvania. It's a cloudy morning here, and for February it is unusually mild instead of cold. Um, Meg says, hello, everyone. And Marilyn says, good morning from a snowy Colorado. Nadia joins us and says, hi, everyone, from Fife. Ah, that's great. Well, we have people in, we have a podcast to go through. So, yes. Welcome. Um, yeah, a quick reminder also to make sure I can click like. You know, like the video. Maybe I should be asking that at the end in case you don't like it. <laughs> you can always unclick it if you don't like it afterwards. Uh, but it does help with the algorithms. Um, and if you haven't done also done so already, make sure you subscribe too. So today then we are going to be talking about the notion of artistic still life. Now, what I mean by this, now still life basically is the idea, it's got an ancient um, history tradition um, throughout art. It really, we really tend to start with the art world, and mostly when we think of still life, or at least I do at any rate, we tend to think of things from uh, the kind of the old masters, the sort of Dutch, Northern European, 16th, 17th century artists uh, with our bowls of fruit and, uh, and bunches of flowers and and... So there's, there's a kind of tradition, but the tradition does, in fact, actually go far further back. I mean, there's a, for example, um, we go back to in Roman times. This one, I think, was a, a fresco from Pompeii in the first century AD, AD. And, you know, you can see quite clearly here we have a glass bowl full of fruit. We've got apples and grapes. We have a cut open, what looks like a cut open pomegranate there. That could be a slice of pizza. Perhaps not. <laughs> Um, we have another apple or an orange or something. We've got an, probably an amphora of wine and uh, some entire pot of something which maybe isn't quite so clear and I can't make out the detail uh, 2,000 years later. But that's a kind of typical idea, you know. So that was, you know, this idea of still life goes back a long way. Um, but where, where, yeah, I mean, where I'm kind of thinking of it is... Uh, Actually, yeah, let's put a little bit of context in this. So what happened was about um, three or four weeks ago, uh, Marilyn got in touch with me and um, was talking. She sent me an image uh, for a bit of feedback, and it was about still life. 
Uh, it was a, a sort of still life entry. And she was talking about a still life entry that she's seen of mine, um, which now some of you with longer memories might may remember. In fact, I have actually used this one a handful of times um, to demonstrate particular aspects of composition. So this was a still life thing that I did during back during lockdown and way back three years ago, in fact, on this uh, podcast here, uh, I did a I did a thing about artistic still life. I kind of figured, however, quite a few of you weren't around watching it three years ago. Those of you that were watching it three years ago probably don't remember everything. And even if you do, the chances are your photography's come on a bit in the last three years. At least I hope it has. And so you might now kind of get take on board some of the information that I talk with a slightly different mindset. So, but basically what I'm going to do though is I'm going to talk about this, about the decisions behind it, about the notion of what still life is and why it's such a useful tool uh, or useful genre to play with, to really kind of sharpen your tools uh, and your, your skills in photography. Um, so I'll come back to this picture in a moment and... Um, so let me just close those. Um, so where were we at? Yes. Yeah, so Marilyn had sent in uh, her picture, and we'll I'll, we'll take a look at that and I'll, uh, as well. That, but that will be count as part of the feedback in this. But she'd said, "I saw your beautiful entry in Photo Crowd, still life with fruit," because um, that actually put that po picture into a uh, Photo Crowd contest, and actually I I, I got first place. I got the uh, expert. Um, yeah, expert first on that one, which was a rather lovely night. No, no, <laughs> no particular prizes or anything beyond uh, top of the leaderboard for that, but it's always, it's always pleasant. Um, anyway, she said, and um, I wondered if you could talk about your lighting setup. It's beautifully soft and yes, just like the old masters of the 17th century. Attached is my still life in natural light, but I can't seem to get the soft shadowy light, even the white gauze, even with white gauze uh, window covering. Any suggestions for improvement would be greatly appreciated. And the thing was, was that when, as Marilyn was, was sort of writing these things and I started to think about how I would respond to it, I thought there's so many different aspects to this that actually it's more than just a sort of three minute response or five minute response on uh, for a feedback session. I thought there really is essentially it's probably worth going back over the notion of artistic still life sort of from first principles almost. And uh, so with. With that in mind, I then said to, to Marilyn, well, look, how about I do, you know, what if we actually do something with a, a kind of still life? And she's a, a podcast de dedicated to it, and she seemed very happy with that idea. So this is where we decided to go. This is the kind of reason for doing the still life. Oh, sorry, just see, I've got a couple more uh, comments in. Um, um, oh, Jack says, can you give me a tip for a reflective surface, not where you don't see the photographer in it, or you... Um, it, or do you have to edit them out? Okay, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, okay, remind me of that one. I'll maybe try and come back to that. Um, Stacey Silva says, I love the old frescoes. Marilyn says, so gorgeous. April says, yes, I remember that shot, love it. Fiji says, that's a great one, I remember it too. Don's joined us from uh, Northumberland. Glad you can make it along, Don. And uh, Rosemary says, yes, the lighting is so pretty. Interesting how we might set up a flash for these, uh, interested in how we might set up a flash for these gloomy winter days. Okay, so these are good good pop, um, ideas and questions for the notion of still life. So let's go back to this notion of the kind of tradition within the art world. And what we might have is if we sort of take something like, um, let me think here, let's go to, no, I don't want, <laughs> let's make a start, where are we? Um, let's try this. Uh, so this one is, um, I think it's, uh, no, a kind of, a, no, or is it still, still, no, it's not still life with cheese. <laughs> no, so I'm getting mixed up. I've, I've lost my sense of, um, okay, I, I clearly deleted one that, oh no, hold on, is it that one? Is that the one? No, nope, that's not the one I'm thinking of. OK, I see. I had notes for Still Life with Cheese and I seem to have deleted that one somewhere along the line. Never mind. <laughs> but if we take a look at, say, this picture here, or a kind of typical idea of, you know, we've got peeling fruit. In this case, we've got oysters. We've got shiny surfaces with a kind of pepper pot. We've got grapes. We've got um, oranges, 
plant life, um, peeled lemon there, uh, tablecloth underneath, half on it, uh, but also wooden table in the background. We've got light coming in, a little bit shining on the back wall, like lit off the back wall. Um, you can see that there's, it's, it's an immense amount of kind of texture and light um, playing around with this one. Similarly with this one, here we go, where there's a lot less in the way of sort of plant life, but we have um, cracked open nuts and nutshells. We've got a silver plate. We've got, uh, again, peeled lemon. Um, not sure, could be, yeah, probably tobacco, I would guess, given the fact that it looks like it's pipe and broken pipes. Yeah, broken pipes under here. Um, a bit of rope. Um, olives, wine, fancy glass goblets. Um, and so, and again, a tablecloth, but tablecloth that's crumpled and a bit of table showing as well as a wall with patterning in the wall. And all it, what, it, what is this about? Why do still life? Um, and essentially there's a couple of things for about this. Uh, one of the first things is it really is it's a chance for two things. One is to show off the artist's skill and the other is for the artist to practice. And of course, it, I suppose the other way around, it starts off with a chance for the artist to practice. And then when he gets it, when he gets it right or she gets it right, to show it off as well, to show off the skill, to be able to paint something like this and to be able to get all those little indentations, to really feel like you know what the feel of that kind of copper uh, tray, you know, stand would be like. You know, you can always feel the slight coolness to the touch of the goblet. Um, you can smell the, 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 the ground up tobacco there and likewise the citrus and you know what it would feel like to hold that. And, and the, the, to get that level of detail, that kind of photographic level of painting, you can't do easily. You've got, you know, it takes a huge amount of practice and skill to get to that point. But the great thing about it is you don't have to worry about anybody else. And this is one of the key things. This is one of the things why I tend to feel that still life is really something you should all be having a go at at home. Because it's one of the great things where you're not having to worry about what the weather is doing, because you can do it indoors. You're not having to worry about other people and whether, whether you're hurting their feelings. You're not having to worry about the landscape and whether, you know, um, whether the wind is going or the sun's gone behind a cloud. You're not having to worry about um, being out on the street and people objecting to you being there or you being in the way of anybody else. You don't have to worry about animals, uh, well, unless they're coming up and climbing over your, <laughs> your stuff. But the, the point being is that you have absolute control over the scene. You have control over the lighting. You have control over the arrangement. You have control over the content. What aspects are you going to include? What aspects are you going to get rid of? How are you going to lay them out? Uh, which ones are going to be in the foreground? Which ones are going to be in the background? How does the colour scheme work? Are all the colours complementing each other or are you deliberately creating particular colour splashes? Are you using notions of leading lines where your eye guides is, is guided from one object to another? How do the objects within it relate to each other? All these aspects, all these, all every single thing you've ever learned or can learn about composition. Composition, colour, lighting, line, form, all of these are embedded in still life. And so fine, you know, you used to have to learn how to do it with a pencil and then with a paintbrush, but we can do it with the camera. We don't have to spend hours painting this. We can set some stuff up on a table or set up a board somewhere. We can set up a backdrop or we can stick it against a wall. Um, we can find something, some way of doing it. And uh, you then have ultimate control. And if you want to, you can go click, you can look at what it does and then go, oh, that's not quite. If I nudge that a bit, click, nudge it again, click, nudge it again, and keep nudging it and keep changing it until you hone and refine every aspect of the photo. And until you go, hey, you know what? I'm really impressed. I like that. So, you know, this is, this is the power of um, really, the more you do that, the more you will really develop your eye and your skills. Um, and that then becomes transferable into everything else you do.
Once you really start to hone your idea of composition, of leading lines, of how light is falling, of how objects are interacting with each other, of how colours are clashing or complementing with each other, all these will feed into absolutely every other aspect of your photography. Whether you're doing sports photography, wildlife photography, architectural photography, street photography, uh, any, and especially if you ever want to do product photography as well. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit more. Why then did people start painting this? The other great one, of course, was flowers as well. Um, so, for example, uh, if I... This one is um, a bouquet of flowers in a wooden vase. It's called by Bruegel, Bruegel the Younger, 1606. Uh, oil on canvas. Now something else to remember about something like this is a lot of still life as well as being um, showing off the skill of the artist was also to do with um, status symbols. Right? So we're quite used to the idea that these days we can wander along to the supermarket or go down to the florist and we can pick up flowers that would normally only be in bloom at a particular time of year, but we can get them almost year round. I mean, almost year round, I can go up to this local supermarket and I can buy tulips uh, or carnations or, you know, uh, sometimes things tend to be likely to be a more seasoned one, you know, but e even then that, that season will be expanded, will be lengthened so that rather than just being around for a few weeks, we might be able to get it for a couple of months either side. Now, Back in the times of, uh, you know, you're talking Northern Europe in the 17th century, a lot of these flowers maybe didn't even grow in the area. So to have them shipped in, to be able to have all these incredibly exotic things and to be able to show them off was a sign of immense wealth and power and status. Likewise, when you put together some of these fancy goblets and silver platters and all this kind of stuff. They are status symbols. And that, so still life then becomes part of showing off your wealth. But then there's another aspect, another aspect to it, which is um, interestingly on a kind of historic level, which is the notion that um, still life, a lot of still life came about because it sort of exploded in popularity around the time or shortly after the Reformation. So in Northern Europe at the time, or you know, just prior to this, the Catholic Church had, was the dominant form of, of religion across the whole of Northern Europe. And then the Reformation came along and the Protestant faith started to, to broke away. And one of the huge criticisms of Catholicism by the Protestants was the notion of iconography, the notion that we were worshipping the image of um, of Christ. We were worshipping gold and wealth and, and stuff like that. And actually there was a move away from the uh, idolatry, um, iconography, this idea of... Uh, and so actually what this did was it shifted away. Suddenly there weren't being paintings of traditional uh, religious subjects because up until this point one of the dominant forms would be paintings of saints, of Christ, of the Virgin Mary of depictions um, at the gates of heaven with St. Peter. Um, so biblical scenes and uh, religious scenes were the dominant form of art up until the Reformation. And then the Reformation, because they're then trying to move away from that, you're then getting into the more mundane, the, the, the real, the ob objects and stuff like that. So still life cr explodes in this sense and so really starts taking over. However, within that, there's still the notion of a lot of symbolism. And symbolism is another area of still life you can actually have huge amounts of fun with, if you decide to. It's not it's absolutely not necessary, um, but there are there's a whole literature um, of um, so for example every flower has a particular meaning so lilies for example um, have a meaning of being of purity of virginity of um, whereas you take something like a uh, well, deadly nightshade um, if so if you get something like that it perhaps refers to the idea of uh, death of um, betrayal perhaps and then an apple be, even though we're talking about moving away from that that notion of the apple and the garden of eden um, is so embedded in 
the Christian tradition that as soon as you see an apple on the table, it's starting to represent something. But if that apple is maybe slightly rotten or has a maggot hole or something like that, it's talking then about the notion of corruption. And that might be corruption of the soul or corruption of the church or some little statement. So actually an awful lot of these pictures that you see um, are littered with hidden meanings if you learn the language of it. And it's a fascinating thing. Go and look it up. Just, you know, hit Google and type in um, hidden meanings of flowers, hidden meanings of objects, hidden meanings of objects in still life. And you will find there's a wealth of information out there. So if you decide to create your own still life, you too can actually pepper it with extra layers of meaning. Sometimes when I'm with clients, though, um, we put in extra things uh, just for the fun of it um, that are meaningful only to them. That maybe in the background there's a CD of, uh, you know, sitting on a shelf that happened to be um, of a piece of music that was played when, um, when the person and their partner first met, for example, or at a special event in their, their history. Or there's an item of clothing which, which is of some significance, maybe, you know, the... Um, a leather glove that their mother used to wear or something like that is sitting somewhere which is acting as a memory and a connection. So this notion of putting extra things into a picture which have a hidden significance so that somebody just looking at it straightforwardly who doesn't know the history, who doesn't know the extra language, wouldn't be aware of. But those who are aware of it have extra layers of meaning that they can draw out of it. And it's a wonderful, fascinating area to move into. Certainly something worth exploring. The point being is that there's a whole history of centuries of history of this in painting and there's nothing to stop you introducing these very same things into photography. So I hope that's kind of starting to give you some ideas. So to understand then that um, still life has a really rich history, it gives you opportunities to really learn and hone your skills in all the different kinds of compositional techniques from leading lines to notions of containment to um, rules of thirds or um, line form also the notion of the way you use light all these kind of things um, as well as playing around with symbolism and stuff if you want to so that's really the your kind of introduction to still life so to give you then an example then with photography, what I want to do, let's go back then to this idea of um, what I was doing with uh, that still life. So what I'll do first of all, let me just, yeah, let me show you what my setup was. Okay, so you saw that picture earlier. In fact, actually, let's just, I don't know what, let's go back to here. Um, there we go. So this photo, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk you through this photo and the decisions behind what I was doing and how I actually did it. So the idea had been I was decided and this was done three years ago to do everything we've just been talking about. Could I do it was a challenge. Could I do a still life in the style of the old masters, that artistic style old. Um, so what do we, so what did I do? I, said, I, I must admit at this point, I got a little bit of help from Maggie as well in finding fruit and, and bits and pieces and cloth. And uh, Maggie was a huge help to me in creating this. So we've got fruit, we've got apples, lemons, oranges, pomegranate, grapes. We've got objects, wooden platter. We've got a uh, metal coffee pot. Um, uh, again, a metal uh, tray um, stand. We've got a ceramic uh, pot. We've got a, a little a butter knife down there. Uh, we've got a cloth running in the background. We've got candle, but we've also got another bit of cloth, which is half overlaying it as well. So we've got all these kind of um, elements which are not untypical in seeing in a still life situation. Now, this then is the setup I did. This is a quick photo I took with my phone. You can see I've got my camera set up here and I'm using actually purely window light. OK, um, I've tethered my camera to my laptop at the time. So you can see down here. Um, so, you know, this is then where it's latching on to. Uh, you've got to get my focal point. Um, we can see up here. I was starting off, I was playing around with a goblet of wine. Uh, I ended up abandoning that one afterwards. This is me just making sure that I'm going roughly the right focus and that the light is coming from the right direction. And what I'm doing here is I'm purely using window light. OK, now the thing about using window light 
is it's available obviously no good if you're wanting to do nighttime shoots um if you are doing a nighttime shoot or you're or or you're using a room where there just really isn't enough light then maybe you want to use a, a flash or uh, if you're going to use a flash i would say a large soft box if you don't have a soft box even a large sheet and then have it sitting back a bit and so that the light fires through the sheet and diffuses what you're looking for is a soft light generally speaking you're wanting something that emulates window light because in if you're trying to get that traditional art feel to your photo then it needs to kind of then the other thing to remember is that back in the 17th century they didn't have electric light okay so nearly everything is either lit by candlelight or it's lit by window light and so generally speaking that notion of window light is the easiest and if you've got your camera on a tripod and you're prepared to set it maybe to a two second timer so that it doesn't wobble you can go really slow you don't have to have a huge amount of window light you could do a two second five second ten second exposure the great thing about still life is it's not going anywhere <laughs> OK, um, the only thing that's likely to cause any form of movement or wobble is actually pressing the shutter on the camera if you've got a very slow shutter speed, in which case, like I say, use a two second timer or something like that. So by the time you go and click and it's gone the two seconds, any slight wobble you might have had on the tripod has gone. OK, so window light, generally speaking, tends to be your best bet. But you, what you want is you want the window light side on to your objects. OK, side on because it's the side light which is creating that sense of depth. It's the shadow on one side of each of the objects, which is giving you that three dimensional feel to the images. OK, so this then was my setup. This here, as you can see, you know. Um, now, what you might have also noticed is I've got a blue cloth and actually the picture itself in this one here is green. And part of that was in the. Um, when I came to to do the blue cloth was had was the cloth I wanted as in because it's got this lovely canvas type texture to it we're looking for natural fibers uh, rather than a piece of nylon or something and this it was a it was the perfect texture but it wasn't the right color and the thing is that you very rarely see blue much blue in paintings from several centuries ago because blue was a really incredibly expensive color it was a really difficult color to manufacture it's very expensive to get the bits and pieces there things need to be imported to create a blue that was stable consequently blue tended to be kept back for something really special this is why you very often see the virgin mary is painted in blue robes and the reason it's blue is because it's significant because it's holy it's a bit like gold it's essentially it's a bit like using gold leaf you know it's it becomes a major status symbol to be able to use blue so you wouldn't have had just a plain blue backdrop uh, so what i did in photoshop afterwards was i color shifted the blue to green to make it look more natural okay um so if uh like i said i'm kind of running through this if you have any questions you know feel free to leave them in the comments and hopefully I'll, I'll periodically check in and catch up i can see marilyn saying great intro and history um thank you i'm glad that's i'm glad that's working okay what i want to do now then is i will take you through um where did i put it okay yes uh i mean open photoshop and what i'm going to do is i'll take you through the set of photos that i did or uh, you know um let me just open is that going to go in there open yes okay right so let me flip over to here and um oh, done something wrong there oh, get rid of that oh, delete that that wasn't what i meant let's go back open <laughs> suddenly i seem to have um Right. OK, go back to open. Right. Here we are. Now, what I'm going to do is what I've done is. What have I done here? Ah, OK. Tell you what, let me come back here to for a sec, because what I need to do is I need to remove things in a particular order um, in order to make sense of what it is I've done. Um, so. Now I got that, that, that. Let's flip back. Okay, so 
<laughs> Apologies for this. Right, so first off then, what we have here is this was my first attempt, okay? So I've arranged everything on here and then I've gone click to sort of see what will happen next. Okay, and you can see that we've got the rough kind of idea, um, but I thought, well, okay, what do I do first? I've got this one here. I've decided that it all looks a bit green on here. Apple sitting back there. So let's swap that around. So I've immediately kind of swapped this around. We had the orange. Let's complement it by putting some green over here and move the red apple over here. So now having done that, I then decided to actually, I yes, I did realize I didn't like the pomegranate being on the left here. It meant that essentially what happens is all the light kind of hits that. It also creates, that's such a strong sense that it also kind of creates a barrier here, which um, then kind of almost pushes you away from there and your eye gets drawn over to the right hand side. So by swapping the pomegranate around to this side, I'm creating more of a kind of sense of containment. And then what I've also done is I've taken the orange peel, which was drooping down, I then looped it back up onto here. So now I'm feeling much, much happier with this as, you, as a basic kind of um, composition. Uh, decided that the coffee pot was just a little bit too far back, shifted that over here, and then, um, ah yes, the next thing, apart from just not nudging the camera slightly, one of the things I found was the, uh, the pear, this little hook going up here, I felt was kind of drawing away slightly. I wanted to move the pear over, so I moved the pear into here, so we're next to the uh, the tumbling grapes. Um, then what have I done? I've shifted, I think I've shifted some of the light slightly. Okay, this is a slightly different way. Um, yeah, I've now started moving the grapes around, making subtle little changes in that. Um, yeah, a little shift in the grapes. Turning the jug handle uh, was another kind of thing there. Um, I then decided that the grapes, uh, the pear did seem to be a bit lost there. So I stood it up, didn't like it much, and then tilted it over. Okay, so that then became the composition. And from that composition, I then created, um, is that going to... don't know quite why it's to, ah, I know it's gone in the wrong place. Okay, so let me come up here. So this then was my, uh, <laughs> shouldn't have started doing it this way, but okay, it doesn't matter. Um, now, one of the other, so what I've, I've gone from, that's the original, and then when I've edited it up, I've kind of cropped in a bit and, but one of the other things you might notice is that there's a, um, the candle is lit in this one. And what I then did, I went in and I, st I did another version. I stuffed the candle out. And there's a reason for that. There's because there's another aspect which is quite interesting in the history of uh, still life and symbolism as well. If you take a look at this photo, which is called, um, which is this, this is, oh, let's see if I can find it. Um, this is Peter Klaus, still life with violin and glass ball. OK, now, as well as having a violin and a glass ball and the glass ball also being interesting because, again, to show off your skills, we're getting the warped nature of the reflections of the violin. But we've also got the artist himself sitting there at his easel. And you can also see the window light now coming in as well. So you get a sense of his studio space on top of that. So now this what he's done, a collection of objects, there's no flowers or food in this one, well, apart from a, it looks like a walnut, I think, has been opened here. But we've got a book, we've got um, quill, um, ink pot tipped over. We've got a goblet, that's been tipped over. There's a skull. Um, there's, this looks something like a pocket watch or a watch of some kind with a key to it uh, as well. And there's a, the interesting bit about this, and it is one of those things um, that crops up quite a lot, is the notion of, uh, where are we? Vanitas. Um, there's a notion of vanitas, V-A-N-I-T-A-S, if you want to look it up. These were ripe with symbolic objects intended to emphasize the transience of life, the futility of earthly pleasure, the pointless quest for power and glory. And vanitas are closely related to the early tradition of memento mori, which is the Latin for um, remember you must die. 
And it's this, again, notion of moving away from, you know, again, a sort of, if you like, an attack on the Catholicism that came before it into the Reformation. The idea of the quest for, you know, the, the, the churches which were rich with gold, the power struggles going on with all the kings and queens and, and lords and, and church and everything else. And it's about the transience that we are but fleeting creatures doomed to die. And we need this reminder sometimes to give us a perspective on what's important in life. And no amount of accumulation of wealth and power can you take with you. We all end up buried in the ground at the end of it. And so it, these paintings then have reminders. So the skull becomes part of it. The upturned glass becomes part of it. The knocked over inkwell becomes part of it. The, even the, the clock, this notion of time going past, becomes part of it. Um, so with all these things, you very often find in a lot of these paintings that that notion of whether you've got a dying flower or um, something going rotten is quite... A, and when you come to candles, one of the things I noticed was very often candles tend to be snuffed out. And so actually my, the fact that I'd lit the candle was me not looking at it properly and I needed to extinguish the candle in order to make sure I actually got um, something which was that little bit more still life-like. Okay, so hoping then that, get, that gives you an idea of um, where, you know, of, of the decisions I made and the fact that you can start playing around with it. Um, okay, a couple more. Uh, comments here. April says, very interesting to see the changes you did and why. VG says, enjoyed the history, enjoyed the demo. Um, lovely art. Meg says, I really like the different diagonal lines of the violin. And Jack says, uh, about the reflection. Okay, reminder there. So, reminder, the thing about a reflection, it depends what you're using. First first of all, if you could use model, if you're using metal things, is the idea of um, maybe getting something which has a textured surface so that a reflection isn't necessarily obvious. Um, the other option, if you if you are really doing, you know, a kind of a mirror ball or so, or there's a, a sheet of something which is definitely going to get you in the reflection. A couple of options here, and one of them is essentially wear black. <laughs> um, and essentially disguise yourself, you know, drape a blanket over you, put a black piece of cloth over you, wear black, have a hat which is low, stick on a balaclava, something which is going to break up your reflection so that in the reflection itself it's not necessarily obvious. Either that or make a feature, like the artist did, of your, or of your reflection. Um, or, in some cases, what uh, people have done is they've made, they've got like a curtain um, with a little where you essentially pull the curtain back, push your camera through the slot and kind of build the curtain around it. And then that way you can, you can take a photo of it. You only need a gap big enough to get your camera lens through. You stand behind it. That's fine because you're monitoring it through the back of the camera or via your laptop if you tethered it. And then that way you don't appear in the reflection. So some kind of cloth in front of you or something. So it's only the cloth that's being reflected and isn't necessarily so obvious. That tends to be the easiest way to not be in the reflection. Either that or you really need to play around with your Photoshop skills afterwards. But that's not always easy to do if you've got a particularly, say, a curved silver ball or a glass bowl or something like that. So I hope that gives you a couple of ideas there, Jack. Um, OK, so the other thing about this still life, to, just to go back, let me um, pull that image up again, because what I want to do as well is just talk you through when I talk about the idea of some of the um, compositional techniques. There's a whole bunch of compositional techniques in here. Right. So, for example, if we talk about the notion of uh, the rule of thirds, I'll tell you what, let me stick a um, fresh line up there let's go to a pencil tool here and roughly what we're talking about here if we do a kind of rule of thirds something like that uh, so if we get that that thirds grid um, what you notice is that there are particular things that are appearing on it so pretty much and it doesn't matter if it's absolutely exact but more or less the bottom third 
is the lower part, you know, just the front of the table. The upper third is basically the back of the cloth. And most of it's happening in the central, in the middle belt. But we've got bits going above, bits going below, so it breaks it up. Then the highest point on this, um, on this particular thing is where the candle is. So the candle breaks above and it sits also on this thirds line, okay? We've also got hooks coming around, this loop coming around over here. Over here we have the, um, the pear and what have you and the grapes coming up. So this point also becomes a kind of a major point. So if you're talking about rule of thirds, then this is one of the ways that you can start playing around with it. Now, um, also, what else are we talking about? We have the notion of containment. Now, some of you may remember me talking about the notion of containment again. And the idea of containment is that the eye doesn't get go shooting out of the side of the photo. What you want to do is, as the eye starts to move towards the side of the photo, that there's something pulling it back in. So when we come to this side, we notice that um, we have the loop of uh, lemon peel comes down here. The pear points this way. This pear is pointing this way. This loop is coming down this way. We've got a knife pointing in. We've got a jug pointing this way. We've got another jug pointing this way. So what's happening is whichever way you look, your eye gets drawn back in. As you start to head over this way, you have these little kind of pointers to say, come back this way. As you start heading this way, you have these other pointers saying, come back this way. OK, so that notion of containment that you don't have something like if these jugs have been turned and pointing out the way, then the eye, if this eye came down off the loop here, hit this jug and the jug was pointing out, your eye would shoot outside of the photo. You wouldn't be staying with it. OK, so that's something to keep in mind. We also have the notion of part of the leading lines here is the way that these grapes tumble down here and then catch up and loop onto um, the orange peel. OK, so you've got a line there. This is also pointing up towards the pomegranate. And then we get our lines coming back around here. So there's elements whereby we're creating leading lines and loops within the picture as well. So this is something that you can have a lot of fun with, is working out whatever you happen to be doing. Now, the point is with this uh, the still life, is it? I'm using here fruit and uh, various objects. It doesn't have to be that. Still life is a collection of objects, uh, just like you had the, the fiddle and the books. You could do um, a collection of um, work tools. You could do a collection of instruments, uh, musical instruments, or um, they, you could have collection of books or uh, whiskies or something or related things you know that um, the idea with still life is that you get a collection of something collection of objects which aren't going anywhere they're not a lot they're not live they're not going to be moving and so and then you can the whole point is that you arrange them into a way that the eye gets drawn in and about if you're wanting to make it look artistic then the other thing to do is have the side light coming in um, and then that gives you that kind of single light idea, which you very often get with the artistic side of things. So hopefully then that this is giving you an idea that you can really play around with your notion of leading lines, containment, shape, form, echoes around. I mean, here we've got, you know, we've got a round apple here, but we've got the round pomegranate and the round. So we've got sort of circular echoes and even the grapes throughout the throughout the picture as well. So there's multiple compositional techniques that you can get in and really play with, with something like this. Um, so huge amounts of fun um, and huge potential to, and the thing is, is you don't have to show anybody else. Nobody else, to, else has to know what you're doing. You can keep going at it. You know, every weekend set up something else have a go at doing something else and just every now and again you will something will go right and you'll go oh I like that save it edit it up put it into a competition but nobody has to see all the ones that went wrong 
Okay, as you saw, you know, when I was I, sh I showed you just things, even when I thought I had, generally speaking, the right idea, I was still then constantly tweaking and adjusting. And then even once I got the final bit, I was then editing. I was getting rid of a hole in the in the, the tablecloth. I was changing the color to the back of the background. I was lightening and darkening and um, dodging and burning and sort of polishing up the, the, the quality of the fruit. So there's plenty of place to play around with your editing skills, too. Uh, what else we got? Um, Susan says, um, oh, to, to Jack, I use a cheap remote and stand well away to the side from the subject. Hope that helps. Of course, brilliant idea there, Susan. Yes. Um, if you can, uh, whether you're using Bluetooth or you've got um, an attached cable or something like that, a remote release. Um, and a lot of modern, I mean, my uh, my camera, my uh, Canon R5, I can, I've got a program, I can actually operate it with my phone if I want. I could be standing next door <laughs> and I could probably be standing in I could probably be on holiday in India or something and I could still operate my camera if somebody here had set it up and so the batteries were working um, so yeah you don't necessarily have to be in the room when you're taking it either or the other thing for that matter 10 second timer click on it and that gives you enough time to escape the room as well so yes uh, good point there and I, um, uh, April says six circular. Vigi says great explanation about keeping focus on the subject. And April says question: Do you have another photo of yours that is more modern themed? Yes. Okay. Good point. What I will do then is I will show you exactly that idea then because that was where exactly where I was going next. So this is taking this idea of um, you know a traditional art form. But you can take exactly the same idea. I did this one again. Some of you will have seen this before with a coffee pot. OK, so what I've got is an espresso pot. I've got a little espresso mug and I've got coffee beans. And this is a variation on themes. I'm sure many of you will have seen on the likes of Guru Shots crowd uh, photo crowd. These kind of um, these kind of uh, photo sites, photo competition sites. Um, the idea of essentially a coffee still life. Um, you sometimes see coffee beans taken from above or you see coffee things with a cinnamon stick or you'll see coffee beans surrounding a mug which is steaming slightly with kind of hot fresh latte or cappuccino in it or, or something nice, bit of froth on the top. There are all sorts of variations you can do with this. And what I've done here is this is exactly the same setup. This is the same cloth only instead, I, this time because this was going for a modern picture, I didn't feel the need to turn it to green. I just decided that I would keep it blue this time. Um, another thing, so this is again um, exactly the same window light coming from the side here. But there is one, there is another difference. There's an interesting little kind of tangent here, but also worth keeping in mind, is the depth of field. Now, when we go to this one here, what you will notice is it's sharp from the uh, the texture of the cloth in the front to the texture of the cloth at the back okay and what I've got what I've done here is I'm using an f18 and there's a very real reason for this which is when an artist back in the 17th century was painting that notion of depth of field and bokeh and what have you didn't really occur to anybody because what happens is when he looks at the front of the table it's in focus. When he looks at the back of the table, it's in focus because his eye is always adjusting to whatever it is he happens to be painting. He's looking at the candlestick, so his eye is focused on the candlestick, so the candlestick is sharp. Then he looks at the, the pear. The pear is sharp because he's looking at it. His eyes are constantly focusing. So if you are looking to emulate specifically that idea of art essentially pre-photography, so from sort of mid-Victorian times backwards, certainly, and really 19th century, even a lot of early 20th century painting, that idea of different bits being in focus doesn't tend to work its way into the painterly world until much more recent times, until really into photographic times, when it was suddenly realised that you would, if you focused on this bit, the bit behind might essentially be out of focus. Whereas if you're doing your own still life on a table, like me going for a modern one here, not worrying about it looking painterly, here I'm using an F5.6. And the 5.6 is just enough of what I needed to make sure that the mug and the pot where I wanted them to be and these coffee beans are nicely in focus. However, at the front here, it's starting to go out of focus. And at the back, these little coffee beans behind, they've gone out of focus. Okay, so, I, so I'm actually using 
the technique um, for drawing your eye to a particular place. One of the techniques we talk about in composition as well is using that depth of focus. So the eye will get drawn to the sharper part and sort of tend to sort of filter out the blurrier parts. So by having a sharp part in your photo, that helps draw your eye to this. Now, that doesn't work in painting because it's all sharp, so you have to use the other compositional tools. But if you're back to this idea of doing something slightly more modern, then at this point what you can do is you can, um, you can use that notion of depth of field, and de so go for a wider aperture, which will give you a shallower depth of field, and then you can kind of introduce that notion of blurring or even bokeh in the background. Now, another way, if you really want to go cool and modern, um, I played around with was this. So in this case, what I did was, um, let me show you the setup for this. So we're in the same setup, this piece of board, this is the very piece of board that I've actually had that piece of cloth over. Only now what I've done, um, I'm just doing a test shot here with a, with a flash on it. But what I've got here is I've got a diffuser. So this is my five in one big reflector, but when you take all the, the reflector stuff off it, you've got a diffuser underneath. And then what I did with the flash was I put the flash on a shelf behind it and bounce the light through the diffuser. This bit of board has got the sort of patterning and sort of slightly reflective. And so when we come to this, now what's happened is the light is all coming, as well as having the the window light coming in for in fact actually I don't I think this has drowned out the window it has drowned out the window light because there isn't actually any light coming from here the light is primarily coming from the back from behind but what I've also done is I do have a reflector or a white thing off to the right just over my right shoulder um, here as you're looking at it from this direction to bounce some of that light back to, to fill in so that this isn't completely in uh, silhouette okay so we've got so that's created a white background it's created a backlight and uh, bounce light as a fill light. And this here is more or less exactly the same composition as this one. I mean, this one's taken from slightly lower. Um, this one's come from slightly up. And the reason this is up is because I wanted to get the reflection of the espresso pot in it. So this is, st you're still, we're still playing around with that notion of still life. We're still using inanimate objects. We're still using the notion of you know, I've got a very triangular shape here. This is sitting more or less on that kind of level of thirds. We've got um, kind of rule of thirds with the with the white in the background, but we're also notion hinting at that notion of symmetry by having the same, roughly about the same amount of reflection of the pot underneath as we've got of the pot above it. So we're using slightly different compositional tools. Um, to take account of how we're doing the light and what have you, and um, but we're still engaging with them. So whether you want to go ultra modern, some uh, very traditional, somewhere in between, it's you can really get to play around with light, reflected light. Whether you use window light or your bouncing flashes all over the place, or even if you want to start using coloured gels and have little edge lights with a hint of orange or blue or purple or anything like that on it, um, still life really is your kind of ultimate tool for playing around. There's so much you can do. Um, okay, so more yeah, comments here. Um, April says, I enjoy this coffee theme. <laughs> Don says, I like the coffee still life. Mm. Meg says, coffee is my favorite thing. Little coffee emoji at all times. Uh, April says, love coffee also, Meg. Uh, Fiji says, doesn't, uh, doesn't smoke is a synonym for motion. Is that considered a still? Yeah, I think you can get away with that little bit of um, smoke just because it's a, um, a moment of extinguish, extinguished. I mean, you know, it's okay. Yeah, that, that one's not really worrying so much. It's, it's more about the fact that you're not really worrying about, say, um, flowers blowing in the breeze or a cat walking across or a portrait or something like that. Um, Vijay says, India ha is noted for its different type of coffee beans. You should visit India, Meg. Uh, we'll treat you to various types of coffee beans, truly exotic ones, and they can take you to coffee plantation too. Well, doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> okay, Vijay says, and she says she's loving that shot. Cool, excellent. So hopefully then that's all giving you a real idea of what you can do with playing around with a notion of still life. Oh, I can barely believe that I've been going on for that for nearly an hour and I still have a couple of feedbacks to give as well. So uh, where do we go from here then? Um, right, so 
first of all, I thank you to to Marilyn then for the, this idea of introducing getting me to come back and reintroduce the notion of still life. Um, and one of the things I suggested actually with the notion of smug points was that if somebody suggests an idea to me that I use, they will get um, an extra set of smug points and how many did it, uh, an extra 30 smug points for suggesting an idea for a podcast that I end up using. So Marilyn gets a bonus of 30 smug points for suggesting the idea of doing one on still life, which I've actually gone ahead and used. So a little bit on the smug points then, there's a quick smug point leaderboard. Um, so with this, where were we? So last week, um, we, if we, right, so if we go back to this idea that at the beginning of uh, each month, we'll, I'll do a, whoever's winning the monthly one. I think Janet won it last week, uh, won January's. Last week we had VG, Nuria, Doriana and Maria all sent in images, giving them 25 smug points each. So they are all kind of in joint first at the moment until I start topping, totting up what's happening here. Remember, you're getting five points just for turning up and leaving a comment. Uh, you get 10 points if you enter a challenge. You get uh, 25 points if you put a picture in for um, critique, which I then use. And you also get 30 points if you introduce a friend as well. And another 30 points if you introduce a topic, because I'm always on the lookout for new topics for these podcasts. Um, uh, April says, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm having trouble getting a new idea. It's not as easy as every as anyone thinks. I, so, uh, one of the things you could, one of the things I want to do with these podcasts as well is, I think, the fact is most of us who are watching, most of you who are watching this, are uh, we belong to things like Photo Crowd, Guru Shots, Viewbug. Uh, very or, or even camera clubs and what we tend to find is quite often there are themes which crop up and sometimes there are themes which really stump us or we put images in for but we never seem to really get the hang of these podcasts are about helping you so if you find that there's a particular theme or there's a particular title whatever whether it's a genre like still life or whether it's a particular theme like two of a kind or these kind of things where you feel like you never quite get the hang of it ask me okay here we have these podcasts are here to help you okay we're all looking to improve our photography so you know what i can do is we come up if you tell me a theme an idea a title or something like that which i think hey that's a good one to do a podcast for and we end up doing a podcast about it then hopefully then we can help you to get, well help everybody who's interested in getting a better understanding so you can score slightly higher and uh, better in whether it's with your camera club or it's these online competitions or just for your own interest in gaining more skills so look around, see what titles there are. Go back through the photo crowd and Viewbug and Guru Shots um, titles and see if there are any that you feel I could really do with help with that and see what you can come up with. Um, where are we? Uh, oh, and April uh, says she did do her homework searching images on still life and Fiji said she did too. Cool. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this is good because next week I am going to be doing a... This is the challenge. So next week we're doing a still life challenge. OK, so hope take on board these ideas, set something up at home. OK, um, if you get the chance, if you don't have anything, but you might have something in your folders, you can always uh, put something in for that. But I'm doing a still life challenge for next week. Try and get your image to me by Friday, Saturday at the absolute latest. Um, anything that turns up too late on a Saturday might not get in, uh, included. Um, certainly anything that turns up on a Sunday won't be. But so still life challenge. I want you to play around, do an arrangement. Now it can be something as complex as a massive bits of fruit and flowers and everything, or you can go really quite simplistic. What can you do with um, three coffee beans and a tea bag? <laughs> um, but the point is, is that what I want you to do is think about the notion of still life. How are you arranging it? How are you lighting it? What are you doing with the composition? Um, to really create something which looks interesting, which is going to hold the attention for a few seconds or more. Um, so that will be the chapter. I'll remind you of that again at the end of the podcast. OK, so um, where are we at? Let's move on then to the feedback session. And uh, let's, I'll tell you what we will do. We will actually start with Marilyn, um, just, to, just to actually talk about now just to give you a little bit of feedback on this. So Marilyn, had, this was the one that sort of kicked it all off. And what Marilyn has said was, um, with our terribly cold weather now, I've been working on still life compositions. 
And then she started talking about seeing my still life with fruit, wondering how I'd done the lighting and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, and was re basically wondering about suggestions for improvement. So just a few things here because I've talked at length about this. So what we have here is we have apples in a bowl. We've got a nice brick background, got a table, uh, a wooden table in the foreground. But essentially the biggest problem that we have here is your white bowl. The white bowl is just grabbing all the attention. In the end, it's not really about the fruit. The, this bowl is so white and it takes up, if you look at, you know, from here to here, it's taking up at least a third of the entire depth of the photo. But the white bowl itself isn't interesting enough. What you really want, now, so if they, these were sitting maybe on a little wooden platter, then you would be making more of the apples. There's the idea of if it's just about the apples and it's primarily about the apples, then arrange the apples in an interesting way. Or do you want to introduce something else? Do you want to half peel one of the apples? Do you want to have them on a platter? Do you want to introduce some grapes or some other fruit to go with it? Um, do you want to cut an apple in half? Do you want to, um, sometimes I've seen things where people have cut an apple in half and cut an orange in half and kind of been half pl sort of placing them together. There's a lot of other things you could do, but the prime, your primary problem with this one is, I think, is that your white bowl just becomes too loud, too attention grabbing and pulls the attention away from the apples. So what you have to think about is what's the purpose? What's the primary narrative? What's the primary point of the photo? And if it's about the apples and the texture of the apples, then you really need to be thinking about how you arrange them for that. So I won't spend any more on that because hopefully everything else that I've told you up until now will have given you uh, some more ideas there, Marilyn. Um, but, you know, that but thank you for sending that one in in the first place. Um, oh, April's suggesting perhaps a silver bowl or wood. And yeah, so that idea of other textures. Um, uh, oh, yeah, VG says even a bitten apple. Yes, and uh, yeah, that's a nice idea as well. Bite taken out of it. There's there's all sorts of ideas of things you can do with that. Uh, Meg really loves the Meg says she really loves the colour of those apples. And the little apple emoji as well. I don't know where you find all these emojis, Meg. <laughs> okay, next one I'm going to talk to is uh, talk about is Janet. So Janet sent in. Um, where are we? This photo here and uh, said, this is a shot of Marilyn Towers, different Marilyn, I think, a uh, condo building in the Mississauga. They do have an interesting shape to them, uh, but I've been trying to find a different or a more interesting composition. Any ideas for something different? OK, so. It's a, certainly an interesting looking building. Uh, the question is then is can you do anything do it, different with it? Now she also sent in, this is the original, we can see colour and we're here we've got bright blue sky. Uh, here she's gone to black and white playing around with it. So I'll tell you what, let's, um, let's open this in Photoshop and just say, now part of the thing here that we're up against is, let me just close that. When we've got this picture here, um, different composition. Now, different composition is either going to come from the way you've cropped it or the angle you're taking it at. And where I'm standing from, there isn't really another angle I can take it at. I mean, the best I can do with something like this is if I do uh, generative expand and let's say I pull this out, something like that, um, and then just, well, I'll just hit generate and uh, see what Photoshop comes up with. Now, not Obviously, this isn't going to be an exact replica. I don't know what the rest of the skyline is like. But really what I'm doing here <clears throat> is I'm just sort of uh, using uh, Photoshop's AI just to get an idea of what a skyline might look like. Um, oh, it seems to have gone for absolutely nothing over there. Um, here, oh, that looks more like a kind of building on fire. I'm not quite sure what's going on. Another building on fire. Strange. They are for a really sort of strange mix here. But I suppose... The idea being that there might be other buildings around and then depending on how you decide to crop those buildings you can kind of change the shape and the eye and and how it will look and all the rest of it um, but the other option then um, without knowing what the skyline is like uh, it then becomes a case of how else might you have shot this 
Now, this has got a very distinctive shape in its own right. And in fact, actually, what I might do, I think let's just open the original one because I think this one is a much higher resolution image that you sent. And if you've got, if you're using a really high resolution camera, now you might be able to zoom in or you might be able to crop. And crop options here, you've got the whole shape here, but actually, if we were to do something like, um, we actually, if we go back to this notion of fill the frame that we were talking about <clears throat> in the last couple, in a couple of things, uh, a couple of podcasts around ago, you can actually just hear what we're doing is just purely concentrating on the notion of shape. And there's variations that you can do with that. So this one, it becomes obviously windows. But if we were to, for example, um, take something like this bit here, we're now really getting into, I'll just take out that corner there. Um, it's now really becoming really quite abstract. It's not necessarily as obvious. We've got to zoom quite in before we go, oh yeah, yeah, okay, that's, that's Windows. But it's not necessarily obvious straight away. Um, and then in fact, <clears throat> you've got, there's another building running along the side of it. And if you were to do something like this, say, um, then we now have two different, we've got curves here and we've got lines there. And this then in itself has again become, we've gone into real kind of um, architectural abstract at this point. And then again, let's just turn that to black. If we wanted to do it, go gradient map, turn it to black and white, and you've abstracted it a level further. So in a notion of this, something like this is abstract, it's architecture, it's fill the frame. So <clears throat> you hit sort of three or four different genres with something like this. So, and that's, I, that's one, so that's one of the things you can do in terms of um, playing with the crop. So if you've got the, you know, or depending if you've got a zoom lens, zooming in on a particular aspect. I think if you've got a big building, sometimes you want to get the whole building in, but if you're standing down at street level and it's disappearing into the distance, in a way you've got there what you want. You've got the building, you've got the spire. We can see how it sort of twirls and shapes. The only other kind of composition is go and stand across the street, go and stand three streets away, go and stand across the, the other side of the lake or the river. Uh, what's it like on a skyline? Or go wider and include some of the other buildings around it. Uh, the other thing to do is maybe go for a different time of day. So you've got a different color background, clouds, texture clouds, long exposure. Of long exposure clouds so they smear across the sky um, so you're either talking weather patterns to get different kinds of backgrounds you're talking uh, positioning so you're standing in a different place or you're talking about cropping and coming in and zeroing in on particular aspects which I think tend to be most powerful if you do a fill the frame approach and miss out the any actual boundaries and sky edges so hope that gives you uh, some ideas there um, Janet um, but yeah, thank you for sending that one in. I think it was kind of an interesting idea. Uh, comments? Oh, VG saying, thanks Marilyn, we could talk about this in length. Uh, Rosemary says, Marilyn, this is your justification for getting a drone. <laughs> Um, VG says, uh, wish lovely view. Um, I love the black and white uh, during dusk or dawn with an orange sky. The, it would also be lovely. Janet says, definitely some good ideas here. Stacey says, I love the shape and design of the building. Okay, <clears throat> on to the, um, oh, and Janet says, I was going to try these for fill the frame challenge, but the buildings were hidden by the fog. Well, fog's another one you can play with, where, especially depending on how it is, if the building, as it sort of disappears up, in just disappears into the fog, that becomes a really interesting idea as well. Uh, right, okay, so onto the final image, and uh, then I will talk again a little bit about the challenge for next week. So, final one then today is April. So April sent in this mushroom, and she said, uh, sorry, here we go, and said, uh, Oh, sorry, something vanished. Where are we? Um, okay, yes. Here's a mushroom I thought was neat looking in the sun, but it is way too bright. Is there any way to tone down the light? Also, is it possible to get rid of the stick without ruining the mushroom? Thanks. Okay, so right down ground level, mushroom, dead leaves. I like the composition. I like the fact that, you know, it is tilting slightly, got this sort of slightly off to one side. Um, 
this is tilting this way, but we've also got little kind of diagonal lines going off to the left with the, the shape of the um, shape of the leaves. So nice little composition. However, as you say, the big problem that we have here is let me just close those ones from Janet. Uh, the big problem that we've got here is the fact that the highlights have blown completely and there's virtually no detail in there at all. And this is a problem with exposure in the first place. Uh, now, depending on how you're using your camera, whether you're using your phone or another camera, it's all about where you're exposing. So second bit, actually, I'll just come to this first, which is about can, can you get rid of the stick? Getting rid of the stick is quite easy if you happen to have the right, um, the right tool. So in Photoshop, if I use the patch tool, uh, spot healing brush tool, and I just come over here, make it slightly wider and then do something like that with luck. Yep, there we go, it's practically vanished. And I'm just kind of tidy up a couple of little bits of background, which I'm maybe not so happy with. And it really is as simple as that. Um, if you don't have a clone tool, um, but maybe you've got, uh, sorry, you don't have the patch tool, but you've got a clone tool, you can always start copying a little bit of leaf over here and start kind of painting in bits um, like that. It gets more difficult because you have to kind of line, I've got to line up a little bit of the edge of the mushroom here and then come up there and paint that over and you have to kind of keep going back and correcting bits and pieces. But it's sort of possible if you want to do that. So, um, but certainly there's plenty of sort of patch and clone tools and bits and pieces if you've got the software for it to get rid of the stick. That's not problematic. Your bigger problem here really is the blown highlights. Now, what I, what, this is where if you shoot in RAW, it can sometimes make a difference because the problem is with a JPEG is a JPEG is a compressed version of the picture. And in, so instead of keeping all the details, it gets rid of what it thinks are insignificant details. And because this was very bright, it's decided that everything becomes a kind of white or yellowy white um, and doesn't bother keeping any of the detail. Whereas if you've got the RAW file, sometimes you can draw extra detail out of the highlights. Uh, which we can't necessarily do here. So the, the best thing to do, I'll duplicate that for a moment and I'll go into Camera Raw and see what we might ha be able to do. See, if I zoom in, sorry, uh, <laughs> let's zoom in a little bit further. Now, if I come to here and I come to the light and I start bringing down the exposure, so I'm gonna make everything darker, what we find is we get a little bit of extra detail around the edges, but we're still not getting any extra detail in where the whites are it's just like all the all the the information is gone there was it was overexposed so really ultimately your main starting point with this is you have to get your exposure right as you take the photo now quite often it's easier to draw details out of the shadow than it is out of the highlights so if you're not sure, um, try different exposure points. When you're pointing your camera at the mushroom, expose on the brighter part of the mushroom. So point the camera and, you know, get your little kind of exposure point, point it at the brighter part of here. And then what it will happen is it will adjust to that. Everything else will become a little bit darker, but at least your highlights won't be completely blown. And then you might find that even though it's darker, you know, so everything else kind of looks a bit like that, you might find it then easier to draw more detail out of some of the shadows in the back um, than it is to try and recreate the highlights that you've lost here. So ultimately, you kind of that's where uh, your problem is. It's it's really in the photo that as you took it. Um, the only other option here is again to go essentially at this point is um, artificial intelligence, where what I do is I select these highlighted bits and then I type in something like um, mushroom texture see what it does with that uh, sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't sometimes it comes up with some really strange interpretations of what we've put but we'll see what it does uh, and sometimes it just takes forever to actually <laughs> This is one of the big problems with this. It's kind of like trying to watch a kettle boil. Oh, there we go. So what we can see here now is, and it's given me three different options here. So that one's still got blown highlights. Um, this one's got a bit more texture here. And as is this one's got a bit, it's still got some blown highlights, but it's added a bit of texture in. Um, cheating, yes. 
uh, really though, this is what I'm saying is at the point that you you if once you've overexposed and it's just gone white, you're really limited to what you could what you've actually what the options that are left to you beyond kind of copying and pasting another bit of mushroom texture into it. So I hope that helps April. So the main thing here is to just make sure that when you're taking the photo, if you're at all uncertain, take two. Do one where you expose for the highlights, do another one where maybe you expose for the darker shadows. All depends which one you feel is maybe over dominating. You, 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 and if you've actually got it on a tripod and you're able to actually, or you're able to keep your camera dead still, you can take one photo which exposes for the highlights, take another one which exposes for the shadows, and maybe one that's in between. And this is called bracketing. You then get three photos, um, different exposure levels, and then you will find that in your, there's quite a lot of software. Photoshop's got it, but Affinity, another uh, photo editing software, then has options for you to put all three in and bracket, and then you can merge them together, and it will balance out so that you get the detail from the shadows where you expose for the darkness, you get the details from the highlights where you expose for the highlights, and then you'll sort of still have the mid-range as well, okay? But if in doubt, if you've only got the chance with one shot because you're only really doing it handheld, if the highlights are likely to be a problem, take a shot with the highlights, expose for the highlights, and then that way you should get the texture that you need without losing too much. So I hope that helps, April. Um, okay, a couple of uh, more things here. Um, where are we? Uh, oh, April said Janet would definitely have done fill the, for the fill the frame abstract. Um, and Susan says, Janet, this would make a super panel of three or four smaller images. Love it. Uh, Rosemary says, I like your ant's eye perspective for April. Uh, so we're now on to April's one. Stacey says, I like how you've got the mushrooms. I hardly ever see mushrooms here. Um, Susan says, fabulous bouquet behind the mushroom. Um, VG says, it's like the stick is supporting the mushroom. Uh, you're going to make a feature of it. Uh, April says, we'll try and remember to do that next time. Long Island has numerous uh, types of mushrooms. Meg says she realizes the mushroom angel into one side it works or mushroom angle I think uh, Rosemary says I bring a foam gardener's kneeling pad to the woods lightweight uh, to rest your camera on the ground that's a good idea that's like a good nice one um, the uh, yes uh, little mats and things like that for for ground uh, you know if you're not if you're slightly worried about your your camera getting mucky or anything like that uh, quite often a good thing right okay so thank you very much to april janet uh, and marilyn for sending in images and particularly to marilyn for kickstarting this whole idea of redoing uh re going over this notion of still life i really hope that it's given you some inspiration because next week we're doing this still life challenge so you've got now the next five four five six days at a push but really you know uh, if you're not doing it by you know, if you've left your homework till saturday morning you're leaving it too late um play around that we're going to do the still life challenge and there are smug points to be won you will get 10 points for sticking an entry in but i will be doing my top three 30 extra smug points for my favorite uh 20 for a, my second favorite and 30 uh, sorry and 10 for a kind of bronze, silver bronze uh, gold silver bronze type idea and i might even throw in an extra five points for anything which i can figure is highly commended but play 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 Get in, find something, what's, what's interesting for you? What have you got lying around the house? It might be kitchen utensils, it might be something in your shed, uh, it might be some kind of hobby thing that you've got. Um, there's all sorts of things and ways you can play around with still life to create something that's gonna be a little bit interesting. And I guarantee everybody is gonna do something slightly different. And then next week, what we will do is we'll go through all the images, I will hand out smug points, and we will hopefully become inspired to see what other people are doing and then go, oh, I like what uh, she's done with those tea bags. Maybe I could try something similar myself. Or I like what somebody's done with um, those pencils and paintbrushes. Maybe I could do something. Um, we're learning, we're taking ideas. And even if you were to start, you know, it's like the thing with the coffee mug I've and coffee beans, I always see in coffee beans, but this is my take on it. I'm doing something different. Nobody else has done exactly what I've done. And even if you decide to set up a mocha pot with coffee beans, you would have a different pot, you would have a different background, you would have different coffee beans and a cup, and you would still do your own version of it. And that's okay, okay? Um, so, and in fact, you know, so use it as a great learning experience. So let's make the most of that. Um, quick little reminder, if you happen to find these podcasts useful, interesting, inspiring or just entertaining and you would like to support them, then 
buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is one of the ways you can do it. Don't forget also to invite your friends along. If you invite a friend along and then they come along and start commenting as well, you also get an extra 30 smug points. Um, send me your images. If you happen to be uh, on Facebook, there's a Facebook group, Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers. Stick your images in there. Tell me a little bit about them. Or if you um, don't want to do it there or you're not on Facebook and you would like to send them to me directly, Kim at kimairs.co.uk okay just make sure you spell the airs right it's all over the place including on the understanding with kim airs um uh, but kim at kimairs.co.uk should reach me um, if it doesn't message me in facebook and we'll find another way of getting you there so that's it thank you ever so much to everybody who's turned up and been to all the supportive comments and the engagement this is what we really like is a nice really engaged um, active podcasts thank you to everybody who sent in images and i really really look forward to seeing what you're all going to come up with um next week uh for the for the challenge take care enjoy the rest of your week bye bye